Aloha, good morning, good afternoon, or good evening. You can go to live in France, but you cannot become a Frenchman. You can go to live in Germany or Turkey or Japan, but you cannot become a German or Turk or Japanese. But anywhere, anyone from any corner of the earth can come to live in America and become an American. Welcome back to A Nation of Immigrants, a new talk show program featuring the lives of immigrants, knowledge, diversity, and inclusion. Brought to you by Think Tank Hawaii and the Kingsfield Law Office. We invite renowned immigrants to discuss their life stories, immigration adventures, and contributions to cultural diversity. Today's guest is Professor Vint Chun. Vint Chun is a faculty member in the College of Education and Human Devel Development at the University of Minnesota. His research and teaching address the needs of immigrants and marginalized students, examine the relationships between educational institutions, families, and the social context, and employ interdisciplinary frameworks for the study of education. A fourth-generation Cambodian-American, Professor Chin received a bachelor degree in political science and government from the University of Arizona, a Master of Arts degree in education psychology from California State University, Northridge, and a Doctor of Philosophy in Education with a focus on child and adolescent development from the University of California, Santa Barbara. In this episode of A Nation of Immigrants, Professor Vichy Chun shares his life story, academic career, and reflections on work, identity, and community with us. Thank you so much for agreeing to be our guest. Welcome, Professor Chun. Hello, thank you. It's an honor to be here. Yeah, Professor Chun, you are. Uh, I read your article about your childhood with your uh, family from a refugee camp to the United States. I just mm -hmm. totally, totally amazed by the story. I, I just, uh, you know, deeply touched. I think I knew a little bit about the Cambodian uh, history. And uh, because there are some, you know, similar the uh, Pol Pot, the the uh, crimes are against the humanity. But I, uh, to be honest, I never been that close to a uh, uh, Cambodian American, and uh, I really appreciated this opportunity to talk with you and about your experience. Please uh, just tell us about tell us about uh, uh, your family, and how did you settle in Minnesota? Well, oh, um, no, thank you, thank you. It's really, it's really great to be here. Um, uh, Minnesota is my home now. Um, uh, I've been here since 2009 when I uh, took a job at the University of Minnesota, but I grew up in uh, Los Angeles, California, where my family uh, resettled after, uh, after living in um, Thai refugee camps. A little bit, little over a year after, um, um, after they fled the, um, you know, they and me, but I was such a baby at the time <laughs> uh, that uh, uh, they fled the Khmer Rouge uh, regime. Um, so after the uh, the Khmer Rouge regime in Cambodia uh, is a period of time from 1975 to 1979, um, in which it was a dark hour in the country's history and something that connects. Uh, Cambodians all over the world. And um, uh, the Vietnamese invaded Cambodia um, in January 1979, um, which uh, provided the opportunity for many Cambodians, including my family, to, um, to make uh, uh, harrowing uh, treks and voyages across the border into Thailand, where they would find uh, some refuge in, uh, in refugee camps. So that, that's a story that. Uh, uh, pretty much all Cambodians, uh, Cambodian refugees, anyways, share. That makes sense. Yes. Yeah. Yes. And uh, uh, you were born in a uh, refugee camp. I was born. Um, I was born. Well, okay. Hang on. Let's see. Do I say the year? Yeah, I say the year. <laughs> I was born in December of 1977, which is pretty much in the middle. Of uh, of that period um, in time in which the communist Khmer Rouge um, 
took control of uh, Cambodia. And so I was born in um, Khmer Rouge communist labor camp. Um, and um, I was a baby, um, well, it was a, a little over one when my parents traveled up to Thailand. Um, so we spent um, about a year and some months in a refugee camp. I have a younger sister who was born in a Thai refugee camp. Yeah. So there's four of us. Yeah, how, how did you make the trip? Is, uh, were you sort of released from the camp? You were allowed to travel? That's a, that's a great question. Um, it's a question I ask all of my uh, family members who were old enough to experience this period because I'm fascinated by that. Um, when the Vietnamese invaded Cambodia um, in 1979, um, the Khmer Rouge uh, kind of fled, right? And in most provinces, in most of the labor camps, uh, uh, there were stories of Khmer Rouge soldiers and officials just kind of leaving, uh, you know, putting their arms down and leaving. Um, and so, uh, you know, my understanding is that um, people didn't know what, people didn't really know what was going on. People were like uh, scrambling. They were going back to the cities because everyone was into the, everyone was in the countryside at this point. And people were, what's the first thing you do? You go look for your family. You go look for your parents that you were separated from, your loved ones and other relatives and maybe friends and neighbors. And so a lot of people um, came back to the capital city of Phnom Penh uh, to, um, to find surviving members of their family. Um, and then my, um, so the story goes that my parents made a, a very difficult decision. They did find, my, my mom did find um, her parents, my grandparents and some of her siblings. And, but it was, it was unclear what would happen in the country still. The country was devastated. Yeah. Um, and my parents made a very difficult decision to uh, travel to Thailand to, to seek refuge. Mm -hmm. They just did not know what was in store for them in their homeland, in the country. So you see a photo there, of um, a camp photo. This is that's in- what, uh, That's yeah. you. That is me. That is yeah, me. Very, they are very, you are very, you are very little killed. Yeah, very, <laughs> very little, very little. Uh, Chun Vichet. Uh, so mm -hmm. I am um, in this, in this camp. I, I think this camp was in Chun Buri, which is another refugee camp, but it was a more of a processing, processing center, a place, a kind of way station um, uh, prior to uh, coming to the United mm -hmm. States. There's another photo, which I did not include. Um, uh, there's another camp photo. That camp was um, in um, Kawadang, which is uh, one of the largest refugee camps in the world. Um, oh. It's cl since closed down. Um, uh, there's another uh, a photo with my younger sister who was born in the camp, and she's a little baby. And my mom had to hold the, her number for her because she's a <laughs> she's a baby. So, um, so you know, I think I think um, what these stories um, remind me of is that. This, these are some of the experiences that connect all of us Cambodians in the diaspora here in the United States, but in Europe, in Australia. Um, these are things that we all um, uh, can relate to. And even for those who didn't ex experience camp life, refugee camp life or uh, communist camp life, um, uh, we've, people had uh, family members perished. People had family members who they never saw again. So. Um, people have different kinds of relationships to these uh, to these atrocities. They have a different relationship to to the genocide. No, it's um, I'm I'm sorry you have to your your family and you have to have to go through all of this. But you know, looking at your resume, I'm totally you know amazed by your accomplishment. You know, from a refugee. Thank you. <laughs> and and, and be, become obviously, you know, you are one of the, you know, a model immigrant. I, I'm not, I don't think you, you will like this, you know, label, you know, the way Asians always be labeled as model, you know, uh, minority, but um, you are very well educated, 
a very well educated bachelor degree, master degree, PhD degree, and now you are a tenure professor at one of the uh, most respected public university. And uh, uh, tell us what, uh, how do you study and how do you research? What do you do right now? And uh, uh, why you choose this career path, not a dentist or a, or a you know, uh, a computer engineer, engineer, or a, a, a lawyer, or or physician. <laughs> you know, you choose to I be a like professor. <laughs> <laughs> Understand? I no, no, no. Your point. Just yeah. kidding. You know, I, I think th that's a, that's a really good question. Um, um, I mean, I've always told people I'm sort of an accidental academic. You know, um, I uh, I attended many different kinds of colleges. I went to the junior college. I attended. Uh, you know, I went, I graduated from the University of Arizona, but I also attended a bunch of different other institutions and trying to find my way as a, as a young man. Um, I, I always, I don't want people to sort of take my journey and my journey is still unfolding, right? Um, I don't want people to take my journey as some kind of like progress narrative necessarily. I think, um, I think you know, so we've heard about like the model minority, right? Asian yep. Americans, and in some ways, uh, I typify that, right? I, I represent that for a lot of people. Um, but I also would caution against that, you know, um, uh, in the sense that I, I think I got really lucky, you know, Mr. Wang, I think I got very lucky in life. And I think I met uh, some people who cared about, me. and I think I, uh, I found some good relationships. Um, I think that, um, um, there were all kinds of circumstances in my life that allowed me to uh, flourish, right? Mm -hmm. And I don't think other people, including people in my own community, have had um, some of those amazing opportunities. Mm -hmm. um, because I have no doubt that uh, people uh, would do amazing things given uh, the right opportunities, mm -hmm. right? So... So I take that as a compliment. I take that very much as a compliment. Yeah. I appreciate yes. it very much. But at the same time, I, I, I'm, I'm always careful because um, uh, um, I, I want to trouble a little bit. I want to poke holes in the idea of mm -hmm. meritocracy because I, <laughs> I, no, I had my troubles. I had my fair troubles along the way, you know, uh, in schools, out of schools, you know. I'm growing up in an immigrant home, a refugee home with, with refugee parents who were just doing the best they can, you know, and growing up, um, growing up, I don't, I don't think people uh, would have said, wow, that is a, a wonderful Asian American family, right? Mm -hmm. You know, we were, we were, we were often looked at as, as kind of like uh, the sort of dregs of society. Right, the burdens uh, in communities. Um, we were not <laughs> the model minority, right? You know, so I think that's the term. I think that's the term that you know I write about, um, and it, it, it's a term that I um, live in, <laughs> and it's a term that I hope to like challenge anytime I can. Precisely. You know I mean? Yes. Yeah. Totally agree. It's uh, you, you, you. You, you're a, a change agent from your publication, from your, your profile, I, I can see that you have this, you know, I always tell my uh, assistants and my students that you, you need to learn, uh, uh, you, you have, have, to, have two capabilities to be able to function in this 21st century. That one is critical thinking and the second is intellectual curiosity. Mm -hmm. And I see both in the qualities in your publication and in your profile, I really, Appreciate that, uh, and you are you from your family is from Cambodia, and I understand Cambodia, like ninety five percent of Cambodians are Buddhist, and uh, I I just uh, want to ask you, because I came to the United States twenty two years ago, and I was I totally agree with you about the, your uh, fortune. Uh, I I'm. I think that both you and I are blessed, even when you came here through different paths, different way, but we are, uh, both of us are blessed about uh, being able to settle down and become part of this American experiment. Uh, how important uh, spiritual uh, support uh, in 95% of Cambodian 
uh, families are uh, partition, partitioning Buddhist. How important the spiritual religious uh, religion is played a role in your community? And because I'm asking this question is I, I was totally thrilled to find out that what Ministerian, the Temple Minnesota is only 20 minutes drive from my house. A few right, years right. ago, I found that. Right, and right. I've been a, a regular visitor ever oh. since. Yeah, and I, I, I can't believe that how did, how did the Cambodian Minnesotans manage to construct the largest Buddhist temple in the United States? It is the largest Buddhist temple in the United States, in, yes. in Hampton, Minnesota. I believe in I, North America. I believe it, it, yes, in the inter, internal North America. Yeah. It, yeah. I, I never get a chance to, you know, I, I, I go there regularly, I donate, I pray, and I never get a chance. I, I look at all the information I get from the Facebook page, from other information, but I, I'm thrilled to have this opportunity to, to ask you, you know, what you know about this temple? What's the story behind this temple? How come you, Cambodian uh, Minnesota, <laughs> get decided we're going to build the largest Buddhist, Buddhist temple in North America in Minnesota? Well, but Mr. Wang... I, I, I wish I could say I was part of that decision-making process, but I was not. <laughs> but, I, but I was just there this weekend to, um, to join in um, on the festivities. Uh, you know, the New Year's has passed, but because of weather, because of all these things, the uh, temple uh, uh, decided to uh, delay some of the uh, celebrations. So I was just there this past weekend with my family. Um, it is an amazing place. It is amazing. It is. The yeah. largest Buddhist temple. Um, in North America is in the farmlands of Minnesota, right there in Hampton, Minnesota. Like you said, 20 minutes from, from where you live. It is, it is pretty magnificent. I was in awe when I, when, I, when I first visited. I thought I was in Cambodia somewhere. Exactly, honestly. yeah. yeah. And a lot of, a lot of the um, artwork right, is imported from Cambodia. Right? Yes. Um, I, I don't know the inner workings of, um, in terms of uh, uh, the, the temple business, but Buddhism and spirituality is a, is a big part of uh, Cambodian people's lives. You know, it's an anchor, right? And I want to be clear that Cambodia is a very diverse uh, kind of population. Cambodia is the, the, you know, the political borders of the, of, of the kingdom of Cambodia. But within Cambodia, there are thriving and healthy, uh, you know, Muslim communities. Uh, mm -hmm. We call them the Cham, right? and um, they are Cambodians too. There are uh, many other minorities in Cambodia, indigenous people. There are indigenous communities in Cambodia, um, and they're part of our society too, um, who, who may not subs uh, subscribe to Buddhism. Mm -hmm. um, but you are correct in the sense that the overwhelming majority of Cambodians do uh, identify as, as Buddhists. Um, and it's a, it's a major part, it's a major part of um, our, our um, sort of like, uh, you know, our, our, our lives, right? It's a major part of the, the way we view the world, right? Um, I, I'm not sure if I'm um, the best son in the sense that I don't go to temple all the time, <laughs> but um, I grew up, I grew up with an altar at home. I grew up with, uh, you know, knowing that uh, worshiping our ancestors paying our respects uh, is something that we have to do. So kind of like my Catholic friend, there is a Buddhist guilt. <laughs> Not as strong, but it, it, it's there. <laughs> I know what you mean. That, I appreciate yeah. it. Thank you so much for sharing yeah, that yeah, with yeah. us. It's a, it's a big part of my life as, uh, uh, as well. It's, uh, I, I grew up you know, a Mahaya, practicing Mahayana. Uh, uh -huh. tradition and but i'm increasingly because i think i'm getting older i'm increasingly you know uh interested in Tarada or parties uh well the boat because i feel extreme infinity to the cambodian people cambodian culture not only about uh not only because of the shared you know, religious tradition but also uh the shared suffering pain and suffering mm -hmm. the cambodians mm -hmm. have endured excruciating the anguish and the witnessed and totally unspeakable you know horrors from the, the genocide and in in the past 20 30 years the globalization and urban prosperity prosperity uh, have given us some hope that modernity 
modernity and the civilization will save us from totalitarian cruelty and barbarity. But unfortunately, looking at the humanitarian crisis in Europe, in Asia, and in Middle East right now, and all of the man-made disasters from uh, war, bombing, lockdown, and all of this, and I have much less faith in our common destiny. I, I you know, one, one quote I repeatedly hear from my Chinese friend is this year, 2022, will be the best year in the next 20 years. Mm -hmm. 2021 was the best year in the next 20 years. Mm -hmm. 2022 will be the best year in 2020, in the next 20 years, which does not give a lot of you know, promise yeah. in the future to hope for. What, what do you think? What, what... Well, I hope, I hope, I hope the, the, the crisis right now um, in Europe, in, in, uh, you know, in Ukraine, I think it's a reminder that, um, that we're, we're still working on, we're still working on this thing, right? Um, and it's a reminder of not only um, a responsibility to um, our fellow, um, you know, men and women, um, you know, right at the moment in Europe, but also those that preceded them, right? Like, like Cambodians, right? Like, and when I say Cambodians, I'm just, I'm talking about Southeast Asian communities here in the U.S. Uh, who came here as displaced people, you know, just like many Ukrainians uh, will, you know, are. And just like, uh, just not too long ago, many Afghans are still uh, working on um, finding and creating new communities. Right, you know, and I and I caution and I caution um, people to think that um, I, I I I encourage people to reflect on this response that we're um, seeing right now for Ukrainians uh, uh, relative to earlier crises, uh, you mm -hmm. know, with Afghans, and I would say with uh, people from the global south, right, versus. White Europeans, right? There's a difference in how people are able to connect with the experiences mm -hmm. of uh, European refugees relative to um, folks from, you know, Asia, folks from, you know, other other places in which um, they don't look, <laughs> you know, the same, right? And so, um, I, 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 that's what I think. Of, right? That's what I think about, and it's it's, it's a something pretty personal and fairly intimate to my own life. You know what I mean? Yeah, yes, I agree. Thank you very much. Well, uh, what, you, you've been away from, uh, you, you were born in, in Cambodia, basically, mm -hmm. and uh, even in a, in a camp. Uh, uh, and when was your last time in Cambodia? Did you get a chance to visit Cambodia often in the past decades? I was there three weeks ago. Oh, for, my. Uh, just oh, a my. Okay. Yeah, I was there. I was. Uh, that was the first time um, uh, since uh, you know during the pandemic, uh, mm -hmm. as things opened up, I was there to uh, conduct a sort of site visit as I uh, am establishing some kind of um, internships and in a broad program at the University okay. of Minnesota, some organizations in Cambodia. I've been traveling to Cambodia, um, um, uh, working on issues of uh, uh, resettlement for Cambodian Americans who are. Uh, who had been forcibly removed and uh, deported from the United States to Cambodia. So mm -hmm. I've been supporting um, individuals and families over there. Um, so like I said, uh, like I said, um, and, and now um, uh, I write about these things to sort of shed some light, uh, enhance understanding of um, people's lives and also uh, to ask some serious questions about uh, particular policies that have led to uh, in these circumstances. Um, I'm an accidental academic, and um, I don't really have some kind of roadmap to the things I study and the things I write about. Uh, they just kind of, <laughs> things happen. Um, I feel that it's my responsibility to address, to address those things, the things that feel most urgent at the time, right? And a lot of these folks um, I've met, they have Minnesota origin, their families are from them, so. Well, it's, it's been some, it's, yeah, it's been some of the most gratifying work. 
Yeah, thank you for doing that. You you definitely make a difference to a lot of people's lives, and uh, I'm glad you have an opportunity to travel. You know, back to Cambodia. Back to the homeland. Yeah, great. It's a uh, I do because of the pandemic is uh, internet travel is coming right. Awesome. Yeah. And uh, for me, it's a uh, it's absolutely uh, you know nearly impossible to travel back to China in the near future. But we can talk about that uh, later. But we, we, we are running out of time, but I do want to ask you two questions. We normally uh, wrap up our show uh -huh. with question to our distinguished guest. Uh -huh, uh -huh. Question one is, uh, if you were giving, to some, uh, giving some advice to yourself in the 20s, what would you say? And ah, second, yes, right. <laughs> yeah, second question is, uh, any books, uh, uh, the fiction or nonfiction, a movie or a documentary you enjoy and you recommend to our audience. Sometimes could be related to your cultural heritage, but not necessarily. <laughs> all. And I have read some uh, books about Cambodia and uh, uh -huh. about Cambodian Buddhism. I have watched a movie about the, the genocide. Mm -hmm. I'm not going to recommend it. I, I want to hear your recommendation, please. Okay. Well, uh, you know, I, I advice for me in my twenties. Well, where do I start? Where do I start? Um, I, I think, I think that um, the, the the advice that um, I would give to myself in my twenties is to just to hang in there, right? Everything that's hard passes, you know. And um, I'm not, I'm not like a, I don't subscribe to the, you know, whatever doesn't kill you make you stronger <laughs> because. <laughs> I'm okay without those hard things, you know, yeah. but, 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 but hard things pass, you know, and I give that to, to, to myself in my twenties, my thirties, and now my forties. <laughs> so I think, um, I think that's something that, um, you know, young people may not fully appreciate. Right? Yes. It's, you know, uh, good books and movies. Well, you know, I, I, gosh, I don't even know where to start, but I'll tell you, I'll tell you something that I was obsessed with for a while that mm -hmm. will surprise people. Um, you know, uh, I, I just finished this uh, series. It's an older uh, TV show. So mm -hmm. This is not like, uh, you know, high intellectual or anything like that, but I just finished the, the TV show, Friday Night Lights. <laughs> okay. It's about Texas football. <laughs> you know? All right. And I was binge watching it on Netflix and I just enjoyed it. It's about small town football. Um, it's about, a, but it's really about people. It's really about the community rallying around this thing that as a source of pride, right? Um, in Texas, of all places. Texas. <laughs> yeah, there's a movie, there's a movie, but I'm talking about the TV show. And I just felt so connected to the different characters, but, you know, it's, it's about people's dreams, about families, things that, mm -hmm. things that are universal to, to us and to our different communities and to the, to the things that we want for our children. You know, so Friday night lights. <laughs> Absolutely, thank you so much. It's, I I I I look very much look forward to watch it. You know what you rec your recommendation just reminded me that when I was in graduate school, my professor uh, teaching international journalism tells me that I have traveled to eighty four countries, and uh, uh, after twenty five years of traveling eighty four countries, my conclusion is people all the same. So I do not distinguish people from their uh, skin color, from their ethnic minority, from their accent, from the language, and uh, because the people are all the same. You know, anywhere, any country, any culture, have good people, bad people, smart people, not too smart people. You know, people have the ability of empathize with other people. People don't have ability to empathize with other people. You know, powerful people, you know, the, you know, govern governors. So I, I, I very much look forward to. I had them never watch a TV show about Texas. Oh, you got to check it out. Yeah, I, mean, I will check it out. Definitely. No, I mean to your point, just the things that connect us in the world in this world are very powerful. Exactly, humanity. At the end of the day, we are all humans. And uh, thank you so much, Professor Chun. No, it's been my pleasure. Yeah, really. it's a great privilege to have you on our show, and uh, uh, amazing to hear your story. Thank you for sharing your your life story, your educational uh, interest, uh, background, and research interest, and your wonderful recommendation of the Texas Football Light. Thank you. <laughs> the pleasure we is hope, all mine. Yeah, we, hope, uh, we hope we can go to the temple together uh, in Absolutely. the summer. 
and we're going to uh, uh, look forward to having you back on the show, and we will discuss more about your research and your work in Cambodia. Much I look better. forward to it. Thank you so much, Professor Chin. A Nation of Immigrants, today's guest of Professor Win Chun from the University of Minnesota. Thank you. Aloha. Thank you so much for watching Think Tech Hawaii. If you like what we do, please like us and click the subscribe button on YouTube and the follow button on Vimeo. You can also follow us on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, and LinkedIn, and donate to us at thinktechhawaii.com. Mahalo.